Good morning, good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr. and welcome back to my podcast, Darling, I'm Depressed Again, Don't Tell My Mother, where we discuss mental health, mental health related topics in teenagers, adolescents, adults, juveniles, college students, high school students, black people, bohemian people, white people. Once you are a human being, once you are breathing, once you are alive, we have something for you. So come on down. And today we are discussing, in case you can tell by the title of the episode, suicide. Yes, suicide. So I wanted to give a little bit of a trigger warning in case anyone is sensitive to the topic of suicide or suicide ideations or anything relating to that. I just wanted you to know in a advance that is what we will be talking about this episode. And the title of this episode is Awareness. Awareness. Okay, let's go. So I'm go- let me tell my story, right? I have told my story before on this podcast about being bullied. I'm not going to go back into that again. But there was such a time where it got so bad, especially after... And I'm not just meaning the bullying, but I'm meaning with my mental state. Um, I was like in the hmm ninth grade. I was in the ninth grade, and my aunt, my auntie, my auntie had passed away. And you know, when my auntie passed away, it felt like a part of my heart had died because she was like she was a second mother to me it wasn't like she wasn't like she was a second mother to me so part of my heart died and then i cried that friday oh i cried i think it was that thursday or that friday and i had to be to school for that monday because you know grieving period yeah you get the grief but people die you still got to go to school still got to get your education no, my mommy wasn't paying for school for nothing. <laughs> I still had to go. And I remember because it was a terrible, terrible, terrible time, completely for everybody. I remember sitting down in class and someone said something to me. And I, I didn't even, I couldn't, rem- I, I couldn't bring myself to even care at that point in time. Because I was, my thought process was, how am I here? And she isn't. How am I here? And one of the most hopeful, one of the most bright people, bright in the spirit, luminous, this light, this brilliant, beautiful light of God. How am I here? And she isn't. And my thoughts went to, I shouldn't be here. And I don't want to be here. Because at that point in time, it was so devastating for me. I was so in shock that it completely, everything in my head just started going awry. I have no idea. I had no idea what was going on at that point in time. All I knew was that I was already depressed prior to her death. I was already hanging on to a thread prior to losing her. And then the events that led up to her death were so were very exhausting for her and it was very you know painful for her to go through and having to see that and you know because i wasn't experiencing it i just was seeing it and seeing her feel that it broke my heart it genuinely broke my heart for her so after all of that after all that right after all that because my auntie died a week before my birthday, January 20. Like a week before my birthday? She died a week before my birthday. And throughout that week after she died, even on my birthday, I didn't know. My birthday was a Saturday. I believe my birthday was a Saturday. Even on that day, I didn't, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to think about anything. The only thing I wanted to know was that I don't want to be here. I don't want to be alive at this moment. 
because one of my favorite people in the world was not. No more simple than that. And so if my hope could be taken away in such a way whereas it broke everything within me, then I don't I don't think that I should be here. And I thought like this for quite some time, and it wasn't until, because, oh boy, <laughs> I thought like this for quite some time, and it really, it really got to me. I'm not going to lie to you, it really got to me because I didn't, I, I, even though, even being depressed um, prior to my aunt's death, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't in a good mental space anyway. So suicide wasn't something that I hadn't already thought about before her death. But after her death, it was a consistent thought. It was a consistent thought. Boom, we're out of funeral. You know, everyone do the crying because, you know, listen, behind your funerals, let me tell y'all something. Y'all never know. <laughs> Boy. Bahamian funerals is something else. Anyway, Bahamian funerals could be something else. You know, not even just a funeral, just a walking in part and, you know, the graveside part. Some people you can't stand behind. No, I ain't gonna lie to you. I ain't gonna lie. Some people, you, when people start that throwing down, sorry, slight tangent. <laughs> when people start that throwing down thing and that, you know, the whole, oh, hold them up, hold them up. I ain't holding nobody up. I'm sorry. I'll let you drop on the floor. I ain't got the time. I already in the men. I already in, in the right mental space. Anyway, past that. We are at her house after the after the uh, event, the funeral. I'm I'm cried out. I have cried every day, screaming at the gravesite. My voice hoarse. My voice gone. My auntie dead. <laughs> I have. Basically, yeah. And one of my aunt's friends came to the came to the funeral. We called her Miss Karen. Miss Karen, I forgot her last name, and I haven't seen her since that day. I have not seen her since that day. But this was such a lovely woman, and a, a very lovely, amazing friend of my aunt's, Miss Karen Teresi, or something like that. This was a love a friend of my aunt's. She came. To the funeral, she came and she told me, did you know your auntie would be so proud of you and how much my auntie loved me, right? And in that moment, it was as if all the wind had gotten sucked out of me because here I was, I the house of my aunt who uh, who had passed having this conversation in her backyard about how she would be proud of me and how much she and how she would how she would be so proud of me and how much she loved me and all i'm thinking is we're talking about her in the past tense now so that means that because i hadn't accepted the fact that my auntie was dead i hadn't i did not honestly speaking because i honestly think that if i had it would not have been a good result i mean even when we went to the funeral home i refused to touch her i did i refused to touch her i would not touch her because touching her would have proved that the last time i touched my aunt was when she was alive when i hugged her and i kissed her that was the last time that was the last time i touched her so we went to the funeral home i refused to touch her i wouldn't even touch her hands i would i would not i refused to because i could not accept the fact that she was dead so immediately after that, we come home and I'm sitting in my room and I'm thinking, oh my God, she's actually dead. She's actually dead. That was my thought. Oh, because I didn't accept it. Honestly speaking, I didn't. Even when we went to the hospital and I watched her get rolled away, even after all of those things. And often for a person who has suicidal thoughts or ideations or anything of that I of that you no know, in within those boundaries, 
the general thought, the general thing to tell them is you are loved, you are important, you are here. Uh, people would miss you so much and all of those wonderful things. And yes, that is true. But for someone who is in that position, who is sitting there and they are thinking those thoughts, the thought inside that person's mind may be, I, all of these people love me and I'm a burden to them. All of these people love me and everything that I have taken on, everything that has happened to me is not only pulling me down, but I'm pulling them down with me. So how do I eliminate what I view as the problem? How do they eliminate, how do we eliminate what we view as the problem? How do you do that? And... I don't think people understand how serious these thoughts can become because it's not do, things have to be incredibly and I mean incredibly incredibly horrendous for someone to even consider suicide. They have to be incredibly horrendous like it has to be where your mind is so overloaded you like you are so broken almost that you can't even fathom the idea of being alive anymore. And a lot of people don't take suicide as seriously as they should until it happens to someone who is close to them or they begin to have those same ideas for themselves. Especially in the black community. Especially in the Bahamian community. Mike, especially in the Bahamian community. We're going to therapy means you're crazy and you need to be put on dire ward. We're going to therapy means something wrong with you. But going to therapy means that means that you're, you're looking for attention. But going to therapy means that you you just ought, you know, especially in the Bohemian community where we demonize those who have mental illnesses. When we demonize, we say, "Oh, that person have a demon. They have a demon. They have a demon. They 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 demonic." I've heard that before. Calling a person who has mental illness demonic. Calling a person who is mentally unwell, who is depressed, who has suicidal tendencies demonic. Not even saying that they themselves have a demon, you know, but saying that they themselves are the demon, that they are demonic because of the way that they are reacting to all the circumstances that have happened in their lives. I've heard that before. And it can be the most frustrating thing to hear because you know that that person isn't demonic that person isn't a demon that person that person's not a demon they need they just need help they need help and what irks me is when i see a christian doing it because instead of uh, no let me not say that what irks me is when i see a person who is pretending to be a christian doing it because instead of praying for that person, instead of asking God to help that person, to guide that person, they begin to cast judgment. Or you see Susie, daughter one go so go swallow pills, say she depressed. Mm, child, please. My 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 man, you see, you see, you see, you see Bricky's Bricky son go and say, man, he he feeling depressed. He won't go hang himself. But these children know about depressed, man. They they always looking for attention. That's what we do. That's what we do. We don't take these things seriously. They're not taken seriously in the in, uh, in the homes. They're not taken seriously in the in the education system, especially. Listen, if someone depressed, if someone feeling you know a little suicidal or a little whatever, we have one big meeting. After that, you never hear about it again. Let's be, <clears throat> especially in the schools. Come on now. Especially in the schools. Come on, one big meeting. Okay, we're here for you. We love you. Boom. Bang, bang, boom, bada, bing. Of course, God is here. Of course. Then that. Boom, bada, bing. Boom, bada, bing. That's it. Nothing else after that. You would never hear about it again. You would never hear about it again. And in part, it's so. it's also really irritating for me because I realized that kids and do not have the access to the mental health resources that they need especially in school these these a lot of these kids don't have access to that they don't i wish that i had access to a therapist when i was in school but i didn't first off 
Therapy ain't cheap. Okay? Therapy ain't cheap. It really ain't. But I wish that I had access to those things in school, and that's why I'm grateful for places like, I believe it's the Grand Bahama Resilience Center, and certain places like that that offer therapy to individuals because they genuinely, they genuinely care about seeing people get better. They genuinely care about helping people, about dealing with mental health, about certain things like that. Because if it wasn't for places offering free therapy, if it wasn't for places making sure that some of these kids and people got help, trust me, we'd have a lot more people die. We will have a lot more than we already do. People don't realize that. People don't take suicide suicidal thoughts seriously. People don't take these things seriously until they're rolling their child away on, on, a, on an ambulance stretcher or they're rolling one of their family members away or they're the ones getting rolled away. We don't take these things as seriously as we should and it's deplorable. It's honestly horrible. It's deplorable and it's horrible. We are dismissive of those who come to us asking for help. We're dismissive of those we say they want attention. Listen, I honestly believe in a cry for help. Some people are crying out for help. <laughs> Listen to me. I remember when I was writing Mine Goes in the Summertime, my first book, my first poetry book. Now, this was, I had written about my emotions that I had felt prior to writing the book, or oh, what's not. But I had written poetry that consisted, because in the first chapter of the book, that's where I had all my sad, depressing, blah, 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 stuff. And stuff inspired by people that I knew who, you know, went through stuff, sad, depressing stuff. But before I published the book, I had written poetry like that for years. And I had shared that poetry and what's not. I remember. I published the book. I had, and I had, you know, because you know, you know, you want to know what people think about your book. You want to know what people think. You like my book. You like my book. I remember I, someone told, came to me and told me, I came to, I went to them and told them, I went to them, sorry, and I asked, so how did you like the book? And they said, oh, I love the book. The book was very nice. I, it was so, so shocking to see because I was like, John, you know, suicide and depression. I was like, wow. I was like, wow. I was like, wow, because if you had been paying attention to me, even though I hid, I hid, I think I, that I hid my mental state very well in those early on years, you would have noticed something wasn't right. You would see something wasn't right. There was like, a lot of people was like, oh my gosh, she was, like, listen, let me tell you something. A lot of people think like, I was just this happy, go lucky child who just very mischievous, very childish person. And I know I can be, I, I am a bit childish. But people read my book and they was like, this nigga was depressed. Like, it's a gen, like, this nigga was suicide. Like, it's a genuinely shocking thing. And I had to sit down and look at it and go like, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. <laughs> and having to explain that, and having to explain why, why did you never ask for help? Well, in my own way, I did. In my own way, I did. But we don't take cries for help seriously. We just take cries for help as people seeking attention. Y'all ever see them people on Facebook who, was, who post, I'm going to go kill myself? Right now, I look at those posts, and sometimes I, it is it, it, it dawns on me that I do, do some of these people. I, I I honestly believe some of those people are serious. Sometimes, honestly, I just can't help myself because I know that sometimes we cry out for help in the oddest of ways. I cried out for help in poetry and speaking. And speech, and whenever I, you know, would speak about certain things, and I cried out for help. And ultimately, what I realized what helped me most was crying out to God. That's what helped me most. Now, if you don't believe in God, I don't know what to tell you. I honestly don't, because that's what I did. That's what I had to do. Me, for me, I had to cry out to God. 
Okay. And you know the funny thing? I think there's a scripture in the Bible that it says God will send help when you need it, or God will help you in your time of need. Whatever I, I whatever whatever that scripture says. And he did help me. He did provide help. And let me tell you something. For all y'all people out there who's saying, oh, if you go to therapy, you don't believe in God. If you go to therapy, you can't believe in Jesus. Let me tell you something. Everything under the sun was made for him, by him, and for him. Okay? Everything under the sun. So me going to therapy, someone going to therapy, a child going to therapy, an adult going to therapy, a preacher, a pastor, a rabbi, whatever you is going to therapy, does not mean that you do not believe in God. What do you think he gave the therapist knowledge for? What do you think he gave the therapist the information for? Me seeking help. Listen, okay, so let's go down this route. If you broke your knee and you went to an orthopedic surgeon, does that mean that you don't believe in God? Because your bones are going to heal, so why go to the surgeon? Why go? It's the same principle. So, because I know there are a lot of people, a lot of people say, oh, you know, all you need is God. Yes, and, and that's, it's, that is so true. And then God will send you help and he will send you the resources for you to get better. And however he decides to do it, whether he does it through a therapist or a pastor or whatever he decides to do it to, just know he's going to do it. Because he did it for me. Yes, but honestly, I really want, I really hope that one day we can begin to change the way that we perceive and talk about suicide and mental health and those things. Because let me tell you all something. You know, like, a lot of people who are in school are depressed. Like, you look at, you look at it. You look at it. Let me tell you something. You don't know what type of home these these children coming from. You don't know what type of home they going home to. You don't know. You have some children. They say the wrong thing. They die. I can't stop them upside the head. You don't know. You don't know. There are people who go through more in the first 10 years of their life than we will ever go through in every single moment of our existence. So we do not know what people go through. So when we see children saying that they're depressed, that they're suicidal, take that seriously because we don't know what happened in their life. We do not know. I don't know anyone's story but my own. And that's the God, that's the God honest truth. That's the truth. We do not know what happened. But we are so quick to dismiss. We are so quick to tell them, you're not depressed. You're, you, you, you just, you don't know what you're talking about. Why is that? Why is that that we won't listen to them? Why is that that we won't hear them? Why is that? I'm telling you, if you are feeling depressed, if you are feeling suicidal, if you are feeling suicidal or any of those things, I am telling you there is hope. There is hope. You just have to continue to hold out for it. There is hope. Things will change. Things can change for you. It doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter who may say that they won't change. It doesn't matter who may dismiss you, who may not believe you. I am telling you, things will change for you. You are loved. You are important. You are here. And that, that is the fact. That is a fact. Those are facts. You are here. So today was a really, really good day. And as an as an activity, you know, as we before I close out, I want to tell you three things that I th I believe, I honestly believe. I believe we each have a purpose. I believe we each have a destiny. And I believe that we are each meant to change the world in one way. And whether we change the world through a thousand people or one, we are each meant to change the world. 
change the world. So don't allow fight. Don't allow what you may be going through now to stop you from hitting your mark. Continue to persevere. Continue to press on. My name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr. And this has been my podcast. Darling, I'm depressed again. Don't tell my mother. Until next time.